Okay. So, families, single parents, lots of single parents, lots of those call me. That just makes it all more difficult because it, if there is a dad involved, I always encourage, or a mom involved, whoever calls me, I always encourage them to bring the other person or somebody else because parents tell me over and over again how intimidating it is to be in a room with a lot of people. And depending on where you go to an IEP meeting, IEP meeting the room can be completely filled. So I encourage them, and you, you do that too, encourage them to bring somebody that can be there and be a second listener. It's kind of like going to the doctor's office and hearing difficult news. You need somebody else to share that with and to help you understand really what happened. Grandparents, great-grandparents, I'm sure you see a lot of those. That is just reality. I don't know what we can do about that. Most of the grandparents that I work with have children who are incarcerated. So that is another issue. And if that's happened, we know that there has been trauma in that child's life. So, hello. Um, so that, that's just a, a given. If you've got a grandparent there, there has been something happen that is traumatic. Uh, poverty, it depends on where you are. Many of you are probably in schools. Uh, if you're in Tulsa Public, you know, the most free lunches of any district. Oklahoma City Schools is the same way. Abuse and neglect, just lots and lots of that. That Again, we have to deal with the remnants of that, although we had nothing to do about it. Uh, the blended families, um, we're having a lot more gender issues in families. Um, gay couples, uh, a lot. Uh, I'm having a lot. So I think it really is helpful to understand those issues to some extent, um, and I have never been at a meeting where that was treated any differently, I must say. Um, you all are just great. You do just take whatever comes into your view, and you do what you need to do with it. Um, homelessness, we have a lot of that. I don't know how much you have in the suburban areas, but we certainly have that a lot in Tulsa Public Schools. Um, and then social media users. And you know, social media, it can be good, it can be bad. But I've talked to a lot of teachers who are dissed on Facebook. I am too old to appreciate Facebook, I guess. And I really find it's very, very difficult. And I know people who, that's where they get all their news, that's where they get everything. But the Facebook um, deal is can be really, really difficult. And I, I'm sure you know that you need to be cautious when you're using Facebook. Uh, and who you let be your friend on Facebook. Um, and I have a kind of a bugaboo about getting too close to your students' families. Um, we we want to know them to a certain extent, but we don't want to be too close because it makes it very difficult to talk about difficult situations uh, or be honest when, when you're kind of in that friend mode. Um, okay. Uh, is that what you told me to do? Okay, let's see. Did I go too far? Uh, actually, I think I already talked about the one before. Okay, now most of you I think were in the first thing when I talked, right? So some of this may be, it may bear repeating again. Um, but really, we, when we have that child, we do not expect to have a child with a disability. I probably am the only one in the world that ever expected that because I'd worked in the field so long and I'm just a glass half full. I mean, honestly, I just kind of always expect the worst and hope for the best. And I thought, you know, it's a very good chance that I will have a child with a developmental disability. Um, I don't know why there was no reason for it, but I don't know. Um, but most people do not expect that. It just comes out of less feel. It, re it affects every single relationship that this family has, every single relationship. They find out who their friends really are. They often feel abandoned. You know, that, that mommy group that you wanted to join, well, you know, maybe you're just not kind of up to that anymore. Um, so it really affects everything. Grandparents, sometimes grandparents are the ones who call me because they first recognize an issue, but sometimes it's the grandparents that are not on board, on board and they are not coming on board because there's nothing wrong with their grandchild. Uh, those of you who have grandchildren understand that. I don't have any yet. Um, I have grand dogs and I worry about them, so I don't want grandchildren because that's enough. Um, it's a huge financial strain and it's interesting because health insurance will call diagnoses an educational issue and the schools used to call these things 
a medical issue, and we just not, the two didn't get together. Uh, now the school is doing a much better job of covering the bases than the medical insurance. We don't, you know, autism, until that law passed, if you heard autism, they weren't going to cover anything. And there were people who would diagno not diagnose autism because of that. And that's another story. That, that is to me not, I mean, I understand it, but, but I'm not sure it's professionally ethical. Um, and then there is persistent stress and fatigue. It's hard enough to raise a typical kid and when you've got a kid with all kinds of different problems. And then this uh, professional overload I hear a lot about. Um, they really feel like that's all they do is deal with professionals. You know, their kid just can't go to school and everything will be fine. They've got to have an intimate relationship with their educational experience. I mean, more than, than typical. Uh, they have to go to doctors. They have to go to speech therapists. They have to go to um, PT. And so they're in school all day, and then the kid has to be drugged everywhere at night. And I tell them now, and it's, it's truth, you're not going to get all you need of these related services in the classroom. We're just not going to get them anymore. Um, and we never really got them to the level, but most of these kids really need additional stuff, and they're going to have to go outside because uh, the schools just cannot provide what they need. They can't provide the same level either. And not, not the same level, not in the same way. And parents do not understand that. They just don't get it. Did I go too far? Yeah, I did. Families and DD. Okay, I, do, I need to go back. Okay, families and developmental disabilities. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of multiple in fam multiples in families. I've had uh, somebody with triplets with autism. I mean, I've had every kid in the family has something going on. Um, and then there is that grief issue, and I think that we, we've talked more about the grief issue with the parent. Parents do have a lot of grief when they find out there is a disability. They worry. They wonder what's going to happen to them. What, what's going to happen if something happens to me? And I can tell you, most of these families do not have Plan B. They do not. And I talk to a lot of families who have a kid graduating, and as we know, you graduate now in senior year. That's just what's going to happen. They have no plan of what to do with them, who's going to keep them, they have a job. So there's no plan B in these families' lives. Um, and so the grief is also felt by the individual with a disability. Most everybody wants to be like everybody else. Until you're an adolescent, then you want to be like everybody else, but you want to be distinctly different than everybody else. People with disabilities want to be like other people. And when they realize they're not quite able to fit in, particularly with autism, they want friendships, they want to be involved, but it's just real hard for them to negotiate. And then I see a lot of uh, grief for the, the adolescents. Um, anxiety, depression, uh, depression, denial, lots of denial. Um, I told about that terrible phone call I had the other day. Um, there may be a conflict with the school about category. category and parents don't understand that the school is not diagnosing, they're categorizing, although your testing in the schools is excellent and you could really take that, many of those testing you could take somewhere else and get um, what you needed because they are so thorough. Um, but the outside diagnosis may have a conflict with what the school categorizes because the school categorizes according to what their testing says and what they see in the classroom. And it used to be years ago, I, you know, we were kind of all on a learning curve about autism. And we didn't really understand that Asperger's type kid. Uh, now you all know that. I don't have to spend any time explaining what autism is or in any of that. Everybody knows. Um, and then those parent professional relationships can be very difficult. So preparing for the IEP meeting. I would, and, and these, these are pie in the sky, I know for some of you, um, but these are just kind of goals that I think would be helpful. And one is to start planning as early as you can. Now, how many of you all do digital IEPs? Jinx does. Oh, TPS does? Well, that you can send a parent the IEP that's on um, EdPlan. I'll send them to you. Huh? I'll send them to you. I thought you faxed them to me. Do you send them to me? Okay, yeah, PDF, okay. If you can do that, I know Jinx has been doing that for a long time, and it's helpful because when a parent calls me and has a school issue, I want to see the IEP. So it's really helpful if they've already got it on a PDF and they can send it to me. So um, 
having, and then we don't have to worry about all that paper business because paper is a big issue. I thought about bringing paper to every IEP I went to because, it, you know, I just want, I want everybody to have a copy when we're, we're talking about it. Review the past IEP and parents notoriously do not do this either. In fact, I hear everything from, I have my IEP right here, I'll get it to you, to what's an IEP. So, you know, it's, it's a spectrum all, all between, but I think we need to um, keep reviewing it and I want parents to do a lot of these things I tell the parents to do. Um, parents do not have copies of their IEPs, I promise you. They, they do not keep them. I talk a lot with parents and I have a parent group that I do. We talk about managing information and how to keep it at your fingertips and you want it there when you need it. When I ask for it, I want you to say it's right here and either read it to me or fax it to me or something. Um, and then, you know, we had the draft is on those ed plan things. Um, but I've always said we need a draft IP before the time and that if, if you can get that draft to the parents. Now, I'm talking about the parents who can do that, who want to do that, or you can encourage to learn how to do that. They, if they don't have a copy, which I bet you 50% of the time they're not going to have a copy of the old IEP, um, I'd like for them and you both to be working on this document ahead of time if you can. Because that will cut IEP meetings drastically, I think, if you do, do some work beforehand. I go to some IEPs that are three hours long. How many of you have been to a three hour long IEP? Ah, yeah, well, hmm. Um, they're very tiring, aren't they? Um, but I like to cut those meetings down. And I think it's harder now because with the ed plan, I don't get them as well. You know, the other one I, I understood, I could look at it like a CPA can look at a spreadsheet and I could see it all. Now I'm, I'm going, okay, now wait, I need to get my yellow pen out so I can say, okay, this is this, this is this, this is this. Huh? They've made some changes? Okay, we'll see. And I don't get those memos, so I've got to relearn every time school starts, as well as your parents do, too. Um, is the document portable? And by that I mean, if this parent picks up and moves to another district, is everything you're doing that is important on that IEP or in some kind of a document, so that those great plans that you have started can shift right to another school? And parents, this is a real, society in flux depending on where you are. Even in Jinx, a lot of people move in and out of that district because they're coming with jobs and going with stuff. Um, and then um, who, who do we really need to get there? How many of you have a hard time getting the players at your meeting? Yeah. Um, and I think if we plan ahead of time and then can you all do, are you all supposed to do your IEP meetings within the school day, the contract day? Well, that's going to be real hard, isn't it? It is, it is hard. It's um, so. Yeah, and, and nobody wants to come early or stay late, but um, it, the earlier you plan, hopefully it's a little easier. And then ask who they would like to bring and again, encourage them. But I think I always tell parents when I'm going to tell the team leader that an advocate is coming because I think that is courtesy. I've had some that refuse to do it, which really sends up the red flags for me, um, but you know, it's, it, that doesn't work um, because it's very seldom now I go to a meeting that somebody has not been with me before. So, you know, we don't have that awkwardness as much, but I do tell them, tell them I'm coming. Um, and then what about the student coming? What about the sibling? Now, I think the student, at a, it, it, there's hardly any time when a student couldn't come to part of the meeting, but be very careful and have that student come in after the difficult part of the meeting is over. They do not need to hear all of these things. I went to a very difficult meeting that I cannot remember who insisted that the student come. Very troubled student. She was so upset by the meeting, she went into impatient <laughs> afterwards. And we need to get that part done and then let the student come in and give their input and hear what the plan is. But they do if it's going to be a difficult meeting, they don't need to hear all of those things. They don't need to hear their parents get gritchy with the school. Uh, they don't need to hear any of that. So have them come in later. And then siblings, I encourage parents to start early telling their siblings, their, the siblings of the child with a disability, exactly what's going on with their sibling. They need to have words that um, are 
real words, autism, whatever. They need to hear that vocabulary. They need to have an input in what their sibling needs. They are the one that most likely will be uh, have some authority over that, hopefully in some way, when their sibling grows older. So I like the siblings to at least know what's going on and, and get their input because the sibling relationship is the longest relationship that we have. Um, outside assessments, you have to consider them. I understand that, but I think it's very helpful. And most districts, when a good assessment has been done by a reliable person, you love them. And it's very helpful. There may be some other things you have to add because really, outside psychologists do not typically want to do IQs and things like that. That is um, something they feel the school needs to do. And the insurance companies also feel like the school is the one who needs to do those those uh, academic and um, IQ assessments. Um, time and place, I went to an IEP meeting at a home recently and the uh, grandmother had a very hard time getting around and we went to the home. It was very enlightening, uh, very helpful. Um, consider the next year, they always want to know what's going to happen next year. I don't know if it's, I care if it's September or October, they typically want to think ahead and they want to know what we're going to do next year. It's almost impossible to know that now because of the way things change and the positions are, the classrooms are moved to different schools and the teachers come and go, but it just kind of a general idea is, is real helpful, not that you have to be pinned down to that. And then agendas. Uh, agendas can be very helpful because it keeps you on track, it kind of keeps the time limited and you go through everything you need to go. So I like a good agenda. I even have some parents who do that, so I think that's a great idea. Okay, the new forms, I don't know what to say. I guess we'll wait till we see them. Um, <laughs> I, I don't find them as clear as the other ones, but you know, we, we have what we have and I don't know who decides on that stuff. Uh, I don't get the memos from the State Department, so if something has changed, I will learn about it at the meeting. So you are a wealth of information for me because I really don't there, keep, you know. There get, are a ton of meetings scheduled to talk about the updates. Um, but see, I don't get those memos and nobody sends them. So, well, you can send them to me and I just might go. Um, and then parents do have a great deal of anxiety about these meetings. Um, they just feel like it's so important and uh, they feel intimidated. So anything you can do to help them feel better. And I think kind of going over the IEP, getting an idea of what they liked, what worked, what they de think didn't work and what suggestions they have. Um, and then rushing, you know, there are some meetings that we can't do in an hour. And somebody told me at church, oh, I haven't seen you in so long. She a, was a principal in Broken Arrow, and she said, I haven't seen you in so long. Every time you come, those meetings are just so long. It's just awful, you know. And so after, it was over, after the service was over, she came up and she said, I didn't really mean what I said. And my husband and I were walking off, and I said, she really did mean what she said. <laughs> she didn't like seeing me coming. But if I come, it's typically there's an issue. So it's not that it's just going to be longer because I'm there necessarily. It's going to be that there was an issue or the parent didn't even want me to come. Now, just because I come does not mean there's an issue. But sometimes parents have, are new at it or they just want somebody to support them. And then encouraging questions. I'm sure you do. Um, and... I like, like, you know, when you're on that ed plan thing and if you're not doing it on the computer and you're marking up that old copy, you're still doing that, right? Marking up that copy that you bring in and changing things a parent wants to change and all of that. Um, I tell parents you want to go home with that copy because often they'll say, we'll clean it up and send it to you. Now, I think it's good for you to send it to because some parents say they changed it. This was on it, but it didn't get on it when I got the clean copy. So I suggest that parents get a copy of that working document and then the clean copy because it's, to me it just makes more sense. It helps everybody. Um, where do you need to follow up? Who else needs information about the student? And of course reviewing is needed. Um, okay, uh, parent school communication. That, when I get to a meeting, the problem always ends up being there was a communication issue. The parent didn't hear it. The teacher didn't hear it. They heard something different. They didn't want to hear it. And often that's on the parent side because it is very hard to take things 
things in. It takes parents a long time to hear these words. Even with a diagnosis, it takes a long time to really acclimate yourself to this new reality about your child. Some parents are relieved because now they have a name and some parents aren't. And then there's that issue, does the student know they have an issue? And some parents do not want to label kids and they will not go to an evaluation. They do not want to do that because they do not want to label their kids. And they often ask me, is this stuff going to stay with them forever? Well, the IEP is not going to stay with the kid forever. Uh, the school records, who, where are your school records? Do you know where your school records are? No, nobody knows where they are. And I don't, I just don't see that it, it's, you know, too much. But we need to really enhance that compliance by communicating effectively, make sure we know what the parent wants. Um, there, I hear a lot of bombshells at IEP meetings and I'm usually the most surprised of all. <laughs> or I'm nudging the parent saying, do they know about and then, you know, they have to tell and then we have to go through that because they didn't tell what was going on that was very important. Um, and then I do think you are good models. I've said that several times, but I think you model how to appropriately communicate with others and how to appropriately advocate because these parents are going to be advocating for the rest of their lives. So you can be a great role model for that. And parents do get to think out loud at these meetings. And it does take time, but it really is worth it. Uh, and then we do want the family to feel confident because, again, we're just here for a short time. They're with this, this um, child for a long, long time. Um, frequent communication, but not too frequent, and that is a hard line. Uh, some parents want way too much. I have seen what they want teachers to write, and you can't possibly do that and teach. So we need to find appropriate ways. There are a lot of things online about to do that. Of, student parent or parent teacher communication. I'm seeing a lot of the student being responsible for writing some of that stuff and, and judging their behavior. I think those are very helpful. You all come up with some great ideas. Um, and I always encourage, and, and I have the same talk reversed for parents. So again, respectful co communication, clarifying, asking questions, not assuming anything, um, don't judge encourage, and again, just asking questions. Um, and if you really are open to this communication, you're interested in other opinions. And uh, sometimes it's some school staff that don't like other opinions. Sometimes it's the parent. A lot of times it's the parent, honestly. Um, you, know, you don't do these things, I know. Criticize, moralize, intimidate, judge. Um, you do see the hard job your parents do, right? You know what it's, it's like for them. Uh, wh when is this over? In 15 minutes? Okay, well, let's go. Um, I think we're already gone back. Okay. Barriers to communication. Past relationships with professionals may have been rocky, or it may have been wonderful. How many of you go to IEP meetings and the parent goes, oh, Mrs. So-and-so was so great. Everything went well. They, they behaved in that class. She knew how to keep order. Blah. And I hear that, and I just go, oh. And I always tell parents I'm going to sit within kicking distance of you at the meeting because I do often lay a hand on an arm or nudge them under the table because that nobody wants to hear how wonderful the last person was. Um, or how bad it was, you know, because that's disrespectful. I don't want somebody to talk about me if I'm not there. Um, unrealistic expectations. And parents do have a different idea of their child than you do because they see them in the home environment and kids really can act differently in the school environment and the home environment. And parents, I wish I had $5 for every time the parent says, he doesn't do this at home. I know there's something wrong at school. He does not do this at home. Well, I bet you if I went into that home, I would see a lot more of the behavior they say that they didn't see. They've adapted to it, they kind of excuse it, and they don't understand that the school environment is an entirely different thing. They're not having to do math and language and transition as much at home, but they are in the school. Um, and then the friend mode. I never called my kids teachers by their first name. If I liked them and thought I wanted to have a relationship with them, it, it was not going to happen when they were my child's teacher because I wanted to feel comfortable saying what I needed to say and I wanted them to say to me what they needed to say. So I think don't get into that friend mode. 
But some of you see kids for several years in a row, don't you? And you, that just happens. But you really have to be careful about that, I think. Um, okay. I think you can encourage them a lot. And they, these families live on hope. That is what they live on. And I see a great deal of depression and anxiety with parents when the kid hits middle school because all these things they thought were going to go away in elementary school are getting worse in middle school because of adolescence and the, the hormones and stuff. So they live on hope. Um, and we have to encourage that, but we have to help them also be realistically, but realistic. Okay. Now, I love this, I love this saying. I love it. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Um, if, you, if what you do, what you say, makes someone feel shamed, and it's happened to me, I know, you just don't forget that. It's very hard to get over, and it, it just dents the self-esteem. It can also happen to you from the family. And again, this is on my talk to parents as well, because I, I just feel so strongly. I have felt that way before. You know, it's like we do 100 good things for families, and one person criticizes us, and it's like the others never happen. I mean, we just feel terrible about them. And so both sides need to be very careful about the language they use, the way they say it. Emails can be very deceptive. Parents often say to me, I got the most horrible email from the teacher. And I say, send it to me, let me read it. They send it to me. It was not a horrible, terrible email. It's really not what you said, but they took it a different way. So you never know really how they're going to take it. And so you have to be careful. Uh, and it is on record, right? How many have had emails come back to bite you? Oh, nobody? Oh, back here. I think he, he has. I think, didn't you have an email that came back to bite you? Okay. So it can happen. I try not to put anything on an email that I don't want everybody in town to know, or maybe even out of town. Okay, what about deal, dealing with difficult situations? Document, document, document. Um, there is that thing every time you talk to a parent that's in the, in the is it on an edu ed plan again or still? Parent contact. parent contact sheet. Use it, and I would keep a spiral and talk and put in there every time you talk to the parent and what you said and what they said to help, I forget what I talked about that morning. So do whatever you can to kind of cover yourself. Um, always involve other staff people and administrators. Um, you need that feedback from others. You need somebody there on, in your court too. So get that help from others. Um, think about what is going on with this family. If something shifts, the parent attitude shifts, you can bet that something has happened Maybe you don't know what it is, but just understanding that something's going on. And then, do you need to look at your feelings and your motivations? We are just people. There are some families that I work with that I really have a hard time with. It's easier for me to get out of that. You all can't. You have to do, you have to deal with who you've got. Um, but sometimes our feelings get in the way. Sometimes it triggers something in us. Um, we're mad about them for something that somebody else has done or, or something. Um, and then do you need to change your approach? And that is when it's helpful to have somebody else be at the meeting or to talk it over with somebody else that you trust that would be honest with you and tell you, yeah, you're a little hard on this family. Um, now, are these parents' goals re realistic? Maybe not. Are yours realistic? Maybe not. Are they high enough? A lot of parents call and say, they're just not pushing my child. They're not doing, you know, the IEP it doesn't have much on it. Well, the IEP is the least of what you do. There's so much more that goes on in your day than that stuff on the IEP. Um, I don't often even look at those goals and objectives as much because there's, I mean, that's just a tiny, tiny bit of what you're doing all day long. Um, some parents, you will never do enough for them. It doesn't matter if you do everything and go be above and beyond, nothing is going to work. That is the narcissistic parent. And when you're working with somebody who has clinical narcissism, it is not about the kid, it is about them. Uh, narcissists are thinking about them and their children are only an extension of their egos. 
And if they feel like their child is getting beaten up on, they feel like you're beating up on them. But again, it is not about the child. I wish I could give you some easy answers about that parent. There aren't any because that's a personality disorder and there's, it's very difficult to even treat that. A person has to understand that what they're doing that and wants to get help. It's very difficult to treat. So you're kind of sunk and hopefully you won't have too many of those. I've had several. Um, Forgive, forget, and move on. Um, now, I've had a couple with Munchausen's. You all know what that is. It's called factitious disorder clinically. Um, I've had a few of those. They love going through the fight. They love going through medical stuff. Um, there's a certain sparkle in the eyes that I've noticed with people with narcissism and um, factitious disorder. They just love it. The worse, the better. I had a mother come to my parents' group, um, and she brought a ring of hospital bracelets that she had kept since the child was born. And my co-leader, who has a child with, uh, had a heart transplant at nine days old, she said, those would have been in the trash before I got out of the hospital. I would not want that reminder. She loved it all. And in fact, she was caught at the hospital pouring out medicine in the sink. So I could see it, and they witnessed it. So she had to be um, monitored when she administered medicine at home for a long time because she really enjoyed her child being sick. Very, very sad situation, but it's hard for doctors to discover it. It's hard for uh, it to be prosecuted. <clears throat> um, okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, the grief factor, and the grief is, is huge, and it comes at different milestones. It's like, a, you know, it, they, they get over the initial thing if it's something they learn at birth, but then every milestone that the child is supposed to reach and maybe doesn't, then it's a whole new set of grief. And then when it's time for the child to go to that preschool that they fantasized, I knew where my kids were going to go to preschool before I had them. Um, you can't do that maybe if you have a child with a disability. They don't drive. They see their brothers and sisters going off to college or doing this or that. They don't have friends. It's very, very depressing for parents to feel that way. Um, they feel intimidated by professionals. You are the experts and they want you to do everything perfectly. And they often know how you should do it, of course, but they do expect you to do it and they expect you to know how to do it. And sometimes we don't have the answers uh, with our children. The future, what's going to happen when I'm gone? I'm telling you that is the first thought they have. And when all is said and done, they really want to feel at the end of the day that they did enough for their children. And in the early days of this autism ep epidemic, um, we were told that we had to do everything we needed to do in the first five years or we were, they were gone. You remember those days? Um, can you imagine the strain that put on parents? They had to work every minute, and they want you to work every minute. They, don't want, want, they do not want lulls in your day. They want you to go and go and go and do everything you possibly can. I'm not talking about every parent, but many parents. Um, and what I've learned, personalities really affect the outcomes for their children and how successful you're going to be working with a parent. And the personality comes, we, we have to deal with what we've got. Um, some parents are really organized and they teach, teach me some things about organization. Other parents don't know where anything is and they will not get notes that come home. Um, the child throws them out the bus window. I've had a lot of kids that evidently throw their stuff out the car window or the bus window before it gets home. Have you, have you noticed that? I, I see that that's kind of diff. I mean, that could happen, yes, but I think sometimes it's just that black hole of their backpack or, or lockers. Um, some parents enjoy fighting, and you know, you've all had them. Uh, we've already talked about that. We've already talked about that. But parents do have that perspective about their child that you also need to um, learn about. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Is that it? I can tell you where to find our headlines, bro. Okay, well, could you write it down? I'm going to see if we have any questions. Oh, you want to tell everybody? I emailed it to you. Oh, you did? Okay. If you go to sde.ok.gov and Click on special, due to index, go to special ed. There's a, on the right side of the screen, there's a blue box that has trainings and all that kind of stuff. For, okay, but there's several classes here on updates. And you were the one who told me about the Every Child Succeeds Act. 
Yeah. I had never heard of that. And evidently nobody else has, yes, right? Yeah. Which is No Child Left Behind is now. Oh, foot. so it's in place of No Child yeah, Left it's Behind. A continuation. <coughs> okay, all right. Any questions, quick questions, or comments? Anything we need to know that would help us in these jobs? Have a wonderful day. You've been a great audience.